Ivan, and thank you very much for this nice presentation, very precise. Uh, thank you to Ramiro for inviting me. Thank you for all people that I mean, uh, helped in organizing this meeting. I just arrived, but I think it's very, it's wonderful actually. So today I will be speaking about paleoecology, and uh, you will be seeing that actually the presentation that I've done today it's quite quite linked to the one that Daniel and uh, Martin said before. So, so so I think the discussion this afternoon will be very nice. Uh, I, first, what's paleoecology? Paleoecology is very simply what you can imagine: it's the ecology of the, st the study of the ecology of the past. Uh, has it been a finding in the 80s, uh, and it's, uh, it contributes to the study of the communities that lived in the past, and also to the paleo environments. So you heard, I think, in the first day about paleo -clima climatology, etc. Now we, we will be more dealing about paleo biology. <clears throat> and so when you deal with uh, with the paleogenetics and paleoecology, you have to fix about. Uh, the time you are dealing with, <clears throat> so we can distinguish two time periods that uh, uh, the one that you, from in the more recent, recent times, uh, from 100 years to 10,000 years ago, uh, and the deeper times for more than 10,000 years, uh, years ago. But even uh, these two periods can be divided in, in uh, even um, longer periods, and you will see how. Uh, uh, paleoecology is a very general, it's a science actually, so it's been uh, developed into many kind of uh, fields of research, like from terrestrial ecology, um, water ecosystems, fresh water ecosystems, marine ecosystems, deep oceans, uh, ice, permafrost, etc. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very wide uh, and it's, there, there are many papers that deal with paleoecology from many, many different perspectives. Uh, this is a quite nice um, uh, paper that I would suggest you to see if you are interested in a more general view of paleoecology that explains how different tools from DNA, fossils, uh, pollens, uh, but also sediments, uh, geology, I mean, uh, can help in understanding the, the, the ecology of the past uh, and also how all these uh, um, proxies, let's say, contributes to the analysis of this, uh, of the past ecosystems, and also how paleoecology has now been proposed uh, as a tool for conservative biology and for studying resilience of ecosystems uh, at different levels. So, among all the studies that we, you can de uh, you can find about paleoecology, I selected once that I think is very nice and very uh, interesting. Also, for the following part of my talk. Uh, which is consists in how, uh, from uh, sediment cores that had been collected in the terrestrial ecos in uh, lake ecosystems, uh, people had reconstructed the, uh, um, uh, the evolutions of the um, uh, cattle the, uh, DNA and she, uh, the, the pasturing activity. Sorry, how uh, from uh, DNA that were collected from sheep and from cows that were in the past, they did use that the, in, uh, the in, in increasing of the uh, pasturing activities over the plants that actually whose DNA dis disappeared over the time. So the the, the sh these sheets from the animals DNA from the pa plants DNA helped in understanding how human developed the um, the agricultural activities in that zones. And this brings me to, uh, to the impact of humans on coastal ecosystems, and we heard a little bit about that before, about this period, the Anthropocene, that is one of the periods which, to which I focus when I still work on paleoecology. So you can, I guess, as I said, you can deal with many different time periods, but I mostly deal with the Anthropocene period, which is, has a, the, the period that has been suggested to be, which is, is controversial, uh, the period where the, the, the area of humans and the period where uh, the humans started having an impact, a significant impact on nature uh, and uh, at the time stay, uh, scale of Easter, or the history of Earth. It means that also human heads had an impact in the past, but from the 17th, 18th century, after the Industrial Revolution, uh, this impact has been significant. And this is what we call the Anthropocene period. So it means that mean all human pollutions, all human activities on coastal sites especially, but not only on coastal sites, of course, have an impact on the marine coastal ecosystem, for example, like uh, uh, all uh, pollutions derived, deriving for, uh, from, the, um, uh, from industries, from agricultures, uh, from the um, changes that we can have in coastal zones, uh, development of arbors, development of aqu aquacultures, all things that, I mean, can, can create the pollution have a direct, direct impact 
on the coastal ecosystems, as, as you know. But we can, uh, and in coastal ecosystem, we can use phytoplankton as a way to uh, monitor this, these changes because phytoplankton is uh, uh, react very quickly to environmental changes, and they also uh, change very rapidly in community. We have a quick response to these changes, to these environmental parameters that change. Uh, so we can study, for example, how the community changes, how and if uh, there are new harmful algal blooms that develop in an area, uh, and also the phenology of the blooms, meaning also the way as a species adapted uh, to, f to environmental changes that occurred over the time. Uh, so to study classically, to study these changes in phytoplankton community over the time, we use time series, time series data. But the limits of time series data is that they only have been constructed and been, been started actually more or less 40 years ago. Uh, there are some examples in Helgoland and this, uh, the continuous plants recorded in England or in France, the REFI network. Uh, but these time series are short, so it means that only 40 years ago is not sufficient uh, to go back in the past and to see, to cover this Anthropocene period, to cover even before the Anthropocene period what, uh, what were the community composition before these human pollutions. So uh, we don't have this link with the past communities and then that's the way uh, to, to how uh, paleoecology actually can complete, can help in understanding uh, the, the, the composition of community of the past, creating a baseline before the uh, big times of biodiversity analysis before this pollution occurred. So in paleoecology, uh, as I said, there are different kinds of paleoecology. You can see one of the, the one I used, the one which is quite common in marine coastal ecosystems, in marine ecosystems, sorry, is the marine sedimentary paleoecological approach, approaches, approaches, sorry, which consists in using sediment cores. In sediment cores that can be separated in layers and dated, and then you can construct, reconstruct uh, the changes in communities uh, uh, starting from these sediment layers. And you can use many different proxies, biological proxies, uh, like uh, foraminifera shelves, pollens, diatoms, structures, resting stages, but also ancient DNA, I'll come back to this, uh, but also geochemical proxies, uh, sti stable isotopes, organic carbon, uh, iron composition, uh, composants, uh, silica, heavy metals to study evolutions of, of pollutions, uh, and also physical, physical proxies, radionucleotides, sediment grain sites, that's very important, and porosity. Uh, for example, for sediment grain sites, one important thing that we have to understand in paleoecology and sedimentary um, uh, paleoecology is that it's a very multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary science. So if you have also to deal with the science that you are not formed to, like for example, I had to do some geology at, at the end. I was not a geologist at all, so, so I had to learn how to study uh, fo by photos, actually these photos that are real cores that have been collected, how f uh, sedimentary faces you know, uh, sediments change it over the time, which helps you in understanding how also rivers inputs um, change it uh, over the times, and this gave you also I mean, an indication of the changes that occur in the coastal ecosystems. Uh, but I mean, uh, among all the th things and proxies that we can uh, use in paleoecology, uh, the one I used the most were the paleogenomic approach, so the use of ancient DNA for the study, uh, uh, for reconstructing base biological communities, and also the approach that we call the resurrection ecology. Uh, resurrection ecology is, is, is not a science apart, but, uh, but it consists in resurrecting species from, resting, uh, from ancient sediments, uh, for resting stages that lived in the past, assuming that the, st the resting stages that were in the past uh, were adapted to the condition of the past. And then you can compare the same species over the time by uh, resurrecting species that, uh, strains, sorry, that uh, of the same species of the different periods. And I'll, I'll show you that. So in pineal genomics, it's, it's a science that's been many, many, very well developed, especially in coastal, in, um, in freshwater ecosystems, in lakes. Uh, so you have many uh, papers that you can look at. Uh, for, first, for example, plankton DNA has been extracted from uh, 125,000 years ago, um, and they've been used to reconstruct the uh, community changes in responses to environmental changes in, during the Anthropocene, uh, and also uh, to study specific dynamics of species. And resurrection ecology also has been studied quite a lot, not for plants and a lot, but especially for cladocerans, insects, for other species that have been used to reconstruct the past. 
so far, um, actually, the, the plankton resting stages have been uh, resurrected until 200 years ago, dinoflagellates, but also diatoms can be revived from most long time ago. Uh, and they've been used to study temporal dynamics and also evolution of uh, population genetic structures, comparing again the geno genotypes of different uh, areas. Uh, what I told you before is the, uh, the fact that paleoecology has been mostly used in freshwater ecosystems, in lakes, also in permafrost, in deep oceans, where actually the sedimentations is quite stable, uh, and so, so you can have quite good um, archives of DNA, for example, so, or also from fossils and resting stages. The, 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 for coastal ecosystem, this is much more complicated because, of course, you can imagine that you have physical processes like uh, waves, tides, uh, bioturbation of animals, etc., that can, inf can, can bias so actually your archive. So, so it was a, a challenge. Also, the first challenge was actually if, whether we can use paleoecology in coastal ecosystems. And so this was what I tried to answer in the first years of my study. I, you know, the answer yes, of course, but I mean, it was quite challenging and you will see how. Uh, and the, the objective, the questions that we have at the end is how we can reconstruct, reconstruct the plankton community changes um, uh, occurring in coastal ecosystem um, by paleoecological approach. How paleoecology can contribute to the studies also of resilience of coastal ecosystems. Uh, so, for those, I mean, I, I mean, many courses in uh, in France and uh, in other parts of the world, but uh, I concentrated uh, this, this talk on the Bay of Brest uh, because the Bay of Brest was um, an important uh, site that had been um, uh, that where uh, uh, ecosystem changes have occurred during the during the years, centuries. Uh, in the 17, 18 centuries, there was a naval town, start to be a naval town, so the development of, of the harbor and the industrial development on the area. Uh, in the, during the Second World War, there's been a, a, a places that has been completely destroyed by the Nazi uh, and by the invasions and the bombing of the Allies uh, uh, because of the invasion that the Nazi um, had in, in the upper part of France. Uh, and since the 50s, actually, after the World War II, uh, the, 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 the science uh, um, um, experienced an, an important interstellar agricultural development that led to eutrophication of the area, and now that has been controlled since the 90s and the changes in the politics of the regions. So what we've done, actually, we collected course uh, in three different zones, two estuaries here, Britain is here, Brest is uh, in the very tip part of Brest, it's uh, quite far, well, it's nice if you want to come. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's two histories, and here the harbor of Brest, that were uh, the longest course actually has been collected, it's a score that covered 5,000 years ago. Um, all cores have been collected by sediment core uh, scuba divers uh, with these tools, and in the, uh, the, uh, the course has been layered in one centimeter layer sediment layer dated by um, uh, late 2010 and cesium uh, 137. Uh, we calculated sediment permeability and granulometry to start to study the percolability of the water during the course in case of for, for, for assessing contaminations of the layers. But especially and more importantly uh, that we have to use when, you, when dealing with the ancient DNA uh, actually very specific procedures that I mean be to apply to avoid contamination as you can imagine. And I, I'll, I'll show you in a little video uh, what we have done, what we can do, <coughs> what's the name of the project. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, Kulemer core that we use for uh, collecting the cores, you see in the harbor. Uh, and the core was deployed from the boats. Uh, we put the camera on the, on the core and then we, you can see that how the core goes into the into the into the into the sediments. Of course, we put the stars here for for the picture. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a joke. Uh, and so we collected the the core. The core has been then <coughs> uh, separated in different layers, in different parts. It was a core of four meters, more or less. You can see with this uh, very hard, the important technological uh, the machinery. <laughs> it's new modern uh, devices. So then I've been collected here. And then what, what happened that one, once we have this, we worked like this. 
So in case we want to work uh, in Palikoj, this is the way we work. We selected the slides layer by layer. Um, and within this layer, <coughs> where, yes, that's, we put this kind of slides to avoid contamination with the um, external DNA immediately after the slicing. Uh, and then we, oh yeah, we collected samples for, uh, for different parameters. I go a little bit faster. So DNA for, for dating, for, um, for um, granulometry, for resting stages, for ancient DNA, and also for uh, uh, contaminants. We have to do this um, wood tongue for a doctor, you know, for the, for the doctors. They use that to avoid metal or plastic contamination for pollutants. So you have to avoid this kind of contaminations. Uh, then we, yes, we preserve the samples. So it was, what was interesting to see for you is the way we work then in the molecular lot lab, which is completely, uh, pro probably now for the COVID crisis is quite, <laughs> we are used to this kind of, <laughs> but in 2018 when they did it, it was quite strange. We have to change every time our clothes, uh, masks and uh, blue uh, lab coats uh, for processing sample by samples, one per sample. Yeah, we have to clean everything sample by sample to avoid contaminations. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the protocol that we use, which is quite, and uh, we have to work in an isolated room. Uh, so for the, this data has been analyzed at three levels of um, biological complexity, from the community complexity, species, uh, and uh, phenotype complexity. For the community, uh, analysis, we use metabarcoding approaches. Uh, for the reconstruction of uh, specific time, uh, sp uh, species dynamics, we used real-time qPCR simply. And for a phenotype analysis, actually, we used those um, resurrected uh, strains, uh, and we applied many different approaches, like uh, ecophysiological approach, metabolomics, microfluidics, and the bad also uh, ecophysiology, classical ecophysiology, and um, mm, metatranscriptomics. So for metabarcoding, so first, for, of course, when you, when you work with ancient DNA, the first question that arises, is this DNA well preserved? Is this DNA degraded? How you can work on that? Is intracellular or extracellular DNA? And that's, the, of course, the question that we have to um, face uh, for uh, assessing the nature of this DNA. Uh, and for that, I mean, in the, in the paper that we have done, actually, we, co we um, compare three different kinds of DNA extraction techniques from intracellular, extracellular DNA extraction, and total DNA extraction techniques. Uh, then, of course, for, the, uh, for degradation of DNA, uh, when degradation of the DNA occurs, it means that the strain, the branch actually reduces in size. Uh, and so we wondered whether we a shorter market, the V7, uh, rather than the V4, which is uh, 400 base pairs, we could have different quite uh, analysis of the biodiversity of the sites. So if we have shorter lengths, probably we can catch different kind of biodiversity. And then for the, those kind of informations that have been compared uh, to uh, data of anthropogenic pressures uh, for uh, the evaluation of coastal ecosystem resilience. And so we made on the same sed uh, sediment samples that we use for DNA analysis, also pollutant, PCBs, and heavy met met metal analysis. So to study uh, the relationship between those contamination and the change in community biology. So for the intracellular and extracellular DNA, I, I will go very quickly, uh, but we just did, did, did different protocols. The protocols that are interesting is for intracellular DNA that had been developed for resting stages that degradates extracellular DNA. Uh, what we had done actually to compare the three different techniques, of course the DNA uh, reduces in uh, quantity over the core, uh, and we compared the intracellular and extracellular DNA we found that extracellular DNA was mostly composed of plants, so not protists. Uh, and so we found that mostly uh, intracellular, ex a total DNA analysis, the, the, the total DNA analysis were computed with those protocols that we I mean are quite common for sediments uh, analysis, are very, very similar. Uh, so DNA, total DNA mostly corresponds to, total, to intracellular DNA analysis. Uh, we also analyze the, uh, by, uh, the, the data that we can achieve the form of sequencing after the, in the different part of course. This is very, very important because actually we, we found that in sun-silted zones, we had much lower diversity than in muddy zones. 
Um, that's why you need to, me to have some information about geology when you do paleoecology. So it means that using muddy sediments, you can achieve much more biodiversity than in sandy sediments. So it's very important to, this is because, I mean, in the muddy sediments, it's less oxygenating, and so the taphonomic processes, the degradation of organic matter processes are very low. So when you compare it again, uh, the total DNA extraction with intracellular DNA extraction, so you uh, uh, analyze the ASV uh, amplicon sequence variants uh, that were in common between the two different uh, extractions, that are the blue ones, you can see that most of the, uh, most of the total ISVs, these are on, the, on one single bars, are in common between the two different extractions. It means that I mean, uh, in muddy sediments, uh, at least in muddy sediments, we had that mostly 80% uh, were, uh, of ISV were in common between the uh, co uh, intracellular total DNA extraction, and this for both V7 and V4 databases. It means, actually at the end, that mean when we extract the total DNA, we extract intracellular DNA. What that is mean con concretely is that intracellular DNA in sediments are those is the sediments is the DNA corresponding to resting stages. This is the, the DNA is that is protected within cells. So it means that when you analyze paleoecology, paleoecological data, mostly you analyze the biodiversity of the resting stages. Then we compare the biodiversity analysis of, by metabarcoding on the two barcodes, the V7, the shorter and the longer, uh, the V4. Uh, and as you can see, we have more similar pictures. This reduces the issue of the degradation of DNA. So it means that at least in muddy sediments, the ones that goes back to the Middle Age, uh, you can have um, the V4, the V4 uh, barcode is useful. You can extract, you can amplify. Uh, DNA and amplify 400 base pair um, the market gene, which is good for taxonomic also uh, identifications. And so, for, um, so we can use this marker for uh, the, until the Middle Age sediments, uh, and also we can we can have a, a more deeply look at the pictures of biodiversity that we have. So we have metazoans in the very upper part of the course. That's logically because the animals are in the upper part of the course. But low, then, then you have resting stages. And what we had actually was this important part of uh, alveolates and especially of gregarines. Uh, gregarines, that's the dark green here, are parasites of animals, of annelids and polychaetes. So mostly what we had in the past, what we, the, 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 the most important part of the paleo communities are gregarines. So it's word of parasites. Uh, and so from this kind of parasites, we are now trying to reconstruct the metazoans that were present in the past. So that's something that we're doing now. Uh, so uh, this is very important because gregarines are uh, a very, very important protist in, in the world of sediments, also in terrestrial ecosystems, and that has been, creates a nice, a nice um, pattern, common pattern between uh, marine sediments and terrestrial ecosystems. So gregarines are very important uh, paleogeological proxies. So then we, like a puzzle, we reconstructed the metabarcoding analysis for the three course that we have done here in the Bay of Brest. Uh, and so the first one in the Brest Harbor, then the other two in the estuaries. Uh, and so we actually reconstructed more or less 100, one, uh, 1,400 years of history of, of biodiversity in France, in the Bay of Brest. Uh, and so the, we have seen some changes in some groups of produce, like dinoflagellates. Um, this community analysis has been done by statistical analysis by the um, MRT analysis that shows two different statistically significant changes in protist communities, the one in the years 40s and the one at the years 90s. As for dinoflagellates here, you can see very clearly that a change from the dominance of order specialis has led to a change, a, a domin dominance of the, of the order goniala calis in, the, in red. Uh, and here, in, in the 90s, we had more changes concerning the genus abundance rather than the order abundance. Uh, the same we had for stramenopiles. For stramenopiles, uh, we had the changes from the dom dominance of mast communities, which are parasites, uh, very well studied here, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and so from the mast uh, dominance to the dominance of, of, um, of, uh, of diatoms. Uh, and also in the 40s, we have shifts in the diatoms communities there. So, of course, when you think at uh, the changes in the 40s, I already told you that we immediately thought at 
uh, the World War II um, uh, impact. But what about World War II impact? It was co quite complicated. So there's a nice, nice part of the work in paleoecology that consists in the work with uh, historians, so we, I, I studied with historians which kind of impact, which kind of part of the World War II could have an impact on marine ecosystems in the Bay of Brest. And so we, uh, we selected some real pictures of the past, so the invasions of the Navy, um, the, the, the construction of the submarine base in the Bay of Brest, which took actually three months to, it's uh, something impressive in Brest when you come. Uh, and so, of course, the, 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 the impressive number of submarines that were present in the, in the, in the past. But also very importantly that what, when the Navy, when the Navy were um, pushed away from Brittany uh, at, at the last part of the world, actually they burned all the fuel um, deposits of uh, army and of fuels. Uh, so this created an impressive uh, um, pollution in the Bay of Brest that lasted two years. Uh, so this is one of the sources of pollution of that time. And of course, also we had the thing that the number of bombs that had been deployed over the territory uh, of Brest and Brittany during the last part of the world uh, by the Allies, by the English, for uh, destroying the Nazi uh, army. And so this was, yeah, there's nice videos that shows that, but if you're interested in the history of the Bay of Brest uh, and the World War II, it's very, very nice. Uh, we also went back, we, can, we, use, we found documents of the past, actually, that mean uh, allowed to demonstrate this uh, quantitatively. Uh, for example, in the 1944, the number of bombs here that were, uh, were deployed on Brest from the 7th uh, August to the 18th of September, only 20 days so were the, called the Siege of Brest, and the, the town of Brest was completely destroyed. Uh, this is 300,000 uh, uh, tons of bombs that when deploying it of the area. So it was really, really impressive. So we can uh, ascribe this to the, uh, this change to the World War II bombing. We thought of that. Uh, and, and then it comes to the other part, the other changed. Uh, after the World War II, I told you that mean the, uh, the, 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 the economy of the region was completely rebuilt. So we, we, the agriculture started developing there. But this means that after the, uh, the, the use of pollutants, the use of uh, pesticides increased over the time. Uh, and this is the, actually the, the trends of nitrogen inputs into the rivers of the Bay of Brest until the 90s, where it, where you can see the sharp increase until the 90s, uh, where now it's coming under control. Uh, so this led to the eutrophication of the area. These pictures, for those of you that came to Britain, also for those of you that know, I mean, uh, led to this uh, green, uh, uh, discoloration of waters and on the play, uh, beaches of, uh, <coughs> of Brittany. And so you can see the same thing here in a more modern way, uh, the, the nitrants that were increasing over the 90s, et cetera, et cetera. And this is another proxy that is used in paleoecology, the relations between titan and calcium that gives you a relation between uh, the impact of the uh, erosions of the, of the soil from the uh, from, uh, uh, from the erosion of the soils that increased or, or, uh, because of the uh, change in agricultural activity. Um, and also, uh, you can see, you can, we, you can, we can link to actually the changes in the erosions and changes in agriculture consists also in changes in uh, uh, plants, uh, um, biology and community structures there. And for example, we found that uh, some uh, onions here um, which is a tree, uh, the, the pollen of the tree increased very much in, in time, which is uh, also a sign of uh, uh, adaptation in climate changes, the oldness. So, of course, we looked for, uh, for pro proofs for, of these uh, pollutions, and we uh, analyzed the old metals and PCBs in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the sediments. We found two peaks of nickel. Uh, it, uh, over the two, during the two periods of the World War I and II, uh, which was interesting also to find that this peak corresponded to similar contamination that were observed in Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor knows it's, uh, it's the Navy, uh, it's the American uh, base that were completely bombed, bombed by the Japanese fleet during the Second World War. So we found a nice correlation, nice similar contaminations. And also we found this uh, then after the, the World War II, we increased this uh, mercury, for example, which is a proxy of, of pesticides activities, and PCBs, that is a proxy of industrial activities that increased in the past until the 90s, 
when they started to be controlled. And this has corro uh, been corroborated, as I told you, by paleogeneological data, which is the data about pollens. Hmm? So we, we reconstructed a little bit the, the word, the, the changes of the plankton uh, in the Bay of Brest. Uh, we ascribed this to uh, the contamination. But what I didn't tell you, tell you about mm, yet was the fact that, that these changes have been considered irreversible. Rever reversible. It means that we didn't found in the recent time the, 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 the community of the past. We didn't find what was present before this contamination. This, I mean, contributes, of course, to the discussion we had in the previous talk about the resilience of coastal ecosystems, at least at the time scales of the 70 years that we studied after contamination, the coastal ecosystem to very abreast we can consider that it was not resilience, it was not community, at least the processes were not resilient to, to those contaminations. So uh, then we can use the same data to reconstruct uh, species dynamics. Uh, and we used the uh, toxic species, the, the, <coughs> the Alexandra minutum, which is a dinoflagellus, which produces toxins in, uh, that accumulates in beavers and then can uh, cause illness to humans that consume these uh, beavers. Uh, and so what we found, um, that I mean, uh, uh, at the, it was, species was present at the 90s, it was only present, but after the 80s, it increased in abundance uh, in, the boat, in two boat cores here that we studied, and uh, completely different from another species for which we analyzed uh, those uh, data. So we, we found this, um, no, okay. Yes, okay. So we compare this data to the also to the monitoring data that had been collected towards the, towards the 80s. Uh, uh, the monitoring, I mean, the microscopy analysis. Uh, and those data are here represented in blue. Uh, and uh, in, um, in red tones here, you have the paleogenetic pale data. And you can, with errors the, on this data, and you can see that we see the similar pattern showing that, I mean, this increase in abundance of uh, the um, uh, Alexandro minutum which, as I told you, it's a toxic species. And this, uh, it's a species that, I mean, produce bloom, blooms. I don't know if you can see the picture here, uh, even uh, nearby uh, oyster zones. Uh, so uh, it even uh, corroborates, those data corroborates the metabarcoding data that when I show you, this is a blow up of the course that I did, uh, the metabarcoding data, where you can see that actually the dark red increase, that this is corresponding to the genus Alexandrum, and the, we specify the genus with the QPCR approach that was Alexandro Minutum that um, contributed to, uh, to, this, to this increase. So let's move to the last part, to the phenotype analysis. To do that, actually I told you that we have to re uh, resurrect um, species from the past. So that's a very important limit that we have in paleogenetics and paleoecology is the fact that very few species and very few strains can be re uh, revived. And so we don't know why. Uh, we don't know why we have these limitations. So what we had done, so it was, we go back to the other approaches, which is the, the approach that the priming approach, they used for seeds in plants in terrestrial ecology to stimulate germination of seeds. Uh, and so we applied some phytohormones uh, or phytobiostimulants that have been used in plants for, for germination of the cysts, of resting stages. And so we, so we have made um, a very deep um, review of all the phytohormones that are used in plants. Uh, are those here um, uh, indicated here? And then we applied those to, uh, to resting stages. Where we try to biostimulate the germination. Uh, and actually, we used uh, three, of, uh, three different kinds of phytohormones, the um, comp comp um, components that change the radox states or the permeability. Uh, there are only two that worked, actually, at the end, so melatonin and the gibberellic acid. Uh, and so the way what we got, actually, by these kind of approaches, first that uh, I told you at the very beginning that the limits for germination of, um, uh, of um, resting stages in the flagellus was, um, was, uh, uh, was fixed at 100 years uh, ago. Um, but actually, with these approaches, actually, we were able to germinate um, and to revive species long, uh, in, uh, more deeply into the past, uh, more, uh, up to, to, uh, to more than 150 years old cysts were used by, were germinated by these biostimulants, and, bus, and also more importantly, we got much more biodiversity of species that were revived by this um, uh, biostimulation approach. 
so we also measure the, the dose effect of those biostimulants. So at the beginning, so here we can use different kind of concentration of these uh, melanotinin and gibberellic, gibberellic acids, uh, different concentration, and the other species that mostly uh, uh, resurrected the, the Scripsella cuminata. And so what you can see that at the very high concentration, 1,000 uh, micromolar, uh, actually the germination will lower, meaning that the, it probably have also a toxic effect on the germination of these uh, of these, um, uh, yes, we can have high concentration can have effect on the germination success. Uh, and also you can see over the time that, I mean, uh, the germination, this is the control, uh, and these are the different kind of uh, uh, the uh, concentration of uh, uh, the number of, of wells actually that germinated uh, with the use of these uh, different kind of uh, concentration of melatonin. And uh, actually, the, we, after five, the, 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 uh, the process occurred very, very quickly, uh, and then it stays uh, uh, in steady states, actually, where you don't have any germination. It means that probably the cyst acquired the, 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 um, the biostimulant, and then they don't, don't acquire it anymore. Uh, so, okay, once we have collected these strains, when we have collected these, uh, um, we wanted to use those strains for anthropological questions. Remember this, this story, uh, and actually, if you can resume this story in a, in a, with a scheme, uh, the eutrophication level, so the, uh, uh, level, the uh, ratio between nitrogen and phosphorus, the dystrophic ratio between those uh, parameters, was uh, high, very high during the 80s, and then reduces the, uh, during the, the, from the 80s to the present time. It means that nitrogen was very, very important in uh, in the 80s, and now it's reducing. But what was the most limiting factor for uh, phytoplankton developing in the area was phosphorus. So the phosphorus limitation increased over the time in the Bay of Brest. So we wondered why and how uh, those resurrected species can, can have uh, adapted to this phosphorus limitation in time. So we used, uh, along the course, we uh, revived uh, three different, uh, we basically worked on three different models. Uh, Alexander Minutum, Scripsella cuminata, and Scripsella dongayenis, uh, try to answer how they adapted to this um, limitation in phosphorus. We, make, uh, we made a po a population genetic analysis and transcriptomic analysis to see if those strains can be separated for the geno genomes, transcriptomes, uh, to the, um, according to the ages. And we didn't find any pattern. Actually, by uh, transcriptome analysis, uh, we didn't find that this, the, the strains of the ages are separated according to the ages. Uh, so uh, no, uh, no, no genomic signature of those adaptations. Also, we make a um, classical ecophysiological approach to try to uh, measure the nitrogen acquisition uh, by the different strains. So this is Scripsella and Alexandrum, different ages, 1992 and 1947. Uh, and we didn't see any pattern uh, neither, so meaning that I mean the, the nitrogen acquisition was similar for, uh, for the old strains. So but we don't we don't give up. So we continue to try to try to understand, uh, and so we more and more quick more deeply into the analysis of the uh, pheno phenotypes uh, analysis. Sorry, uh, so we did metabolomics analysis of the revived strange, uh, strains strains. <clears throat> Uh, for example, from Scripsella, of 20 years of difference here, and for Alexandro Manutum, uh, from 10 years of difference. We cultivated those strains in a phosphorus limitation condition with only one single source of phosphorus, the phosphate here, uh, very limiting condition to measure how they adapted to the phosphorus and phosphate specific limitation. Uh, we make a metabolomic analysis, which allows to have an idea of all the metabolites that the species produces in those cultural conditions. And especially we uh, we concentrating on lipophilic compounds. As we analyze all the compounds that were uh, co produced, lipophilic compounds that were uh, pr uh, produced by those strains, and we also found that a lot of compounds were similar, uh, were um, common uh, between all strains of different ages, but also we found that there are similar uh, um, compounds that were specific to strains, even of different ages, meaning that the physiology of the, of the of the of the strains are quite prob probably different according to the ages, and then we m measure those um, th those um, uh, compounds, the, the all compounds, all metabol metabolites in this PCA, PCA 
uh, in three dimensions. Uh, we, uh, we measure three different uh, phases of the grow culture conditions, and we separated the, yeah, the ancient strains with the modern strains, in blue and red, respectively. Uh, and so you, you can see easily that the difference between the recent and the ancient strains are higher than the differences between the different growth phases. So it means that really they were separated, at least for Scripsella dongayenis. So Scripsella dongayenis strains have different metabolites according to the ages, uh, but not Alexandro Minutum. Alexandro Minutum, you can see that the pattern is much more confused. Uh, and so the, the different, uh, we, ca we couldn't separate Alexandro Minutum by, di by different ages. But remember that we only isolate Alexandro Minutum for uh, a, 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 between uh, 10 years of differences. So we wanted to go more deeply again. And so we now try to separate much more the strains isolated. And so we work at 50 years of differences. So we work before the uh, during the Second World War, before this phosphorus limitation increase, and after the phosphorus limitation increase, after, after the, uh, in 1992, when uh, the nitrogen condition of the area started to decrease. Uh, and we make another important, uh, nice approach that work at that single cell level by um, macrofluidic approach, so to work on the phenotypes of one single cells, to work more deeply in the, in the physiology of the cell, uh, so I don't know if you know microfluidics, it's a, it's a technique uh, similar to flow cytometry that allows you to separate compartmentalized cells in the micro wells. Uh, so you can see the droplet here that passes like microfluidics and when you see a, a red uh, spot, it's mean that the cell is detected and is separated and compartmentalized in the micro wells. It's very tiny, something like this. Um, and you can see that the cells are alive. So you can measure physiology of the cells at single cell level. Uh, what we have done is we measure, measure the alkaline phosphatase activity, uh, which is the, um, an enzyme that is produced during phosphorus limitation. So it's, um, we can use the dynamic of the limitation of phosphorus uh, by these enz enzyme productions. And then you can market those uh, uh, those, uh, the, the sites where this uh, enzyme is produced, and then to measure by image how much uh, quantity of, quantity, quantity, uh, quantity of these enzymes are produced. And so what we have done, uh, of course, we use this uh, specific uh, functional activity to separate the, the different strains. Uh, so first, uh, we have different uh, strains of Scripsial and Alexandrum of different years, and this is the microfluidics results. So it means that uh, all the uh, physiology at minutes uh, time scales of the production of the enzyme uh, sites, of the upper uh, enzyme sites, over the 20 minutes. So you can see that increase in time, uh, but also some cells actually behave similarly. It means that within a flask, you have similar uh, activity of the upper production. Uh, for some strains it's quite different, but in general we can use uh, the, all the, 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 the cultures to have, I mean, there's no, a, a lot of differences between cell in the, in the culture for this particular function. Uh, function. Uh, so the same, um, the cells of population of the same age have comparable APA, uh, APA. Uh, a low phenotypic heterogenic with these strains. This was one of the results also that we have by microfluidics. So we can compare the, the strains, and was, this was the most striking probably uh, um, results that we had. Uh, actually, the strains of the Scripsella trochoidea of 1947s produced high APAD, so it means that were um, um, high uh, APAD and the uh, species that uh, the, uh, the strains that were more recent, and the same for Alexandro Minutum. It, it means that it means that the uh, the species and the strains of the more recent strains were adapted actually to these uh, phosphorus limitation conditions by producing less uh, APA. So since they produce less enzymes, that mean uh, it's a proxy of phosphorus limitation. They probably adapted to this limitation over the time. This is the, the theory that we proposed and uh, how it can work. Of course, it's not a conclusion, it's a working hypothesis, which is much more 
uh, complicating than that. So it also goes to the evolutionary biology that we didn't approach. Um, so we, we, didn't, we, we have both adapted to the changing environmental condition of the bay of breasts. So th already that two species adapted to these limiting condition in the same way by adapting to this phosphorus uh, limitation. But uh, remember that Alexander Manutus is more adapted than, uh, than Scripsiella because they produce less APA. So it means that probably the Alexandro Minutum have optimized the way it uh, um, stocks is the phosphorus uh, in, in the cells. We know that Alexandro Minutum can stocks the phosphorus, and so probably this is the ecological, um, let's say, evolution that he um, actually evolved uh, to optimize this limitation. And that's also, it explains actually why Alexandro Minutum, remember the, what I told you about the QPCR approach and increase in time of uh, this species of the time. That's why probably this species uh, began, became uh, very important and inv invasive in the Bay of Breast because this is uh, uh, adapted to these phosphorus limitations. So it comes to the, to the end of the talk, to the highlights. There are not conclusions, of course, but there are some highlights. Um, we found that the protist paleo communities were mostly composing of resting stages. This gives you a, um, an idea of what we can do in paleoecology, but also the limits of paleoecology. Um, we found in the Bay of Breast that the protist division shift coincided con with the pollution occurred in, during the World War II. This means that mean, human activity, even very, I mean, um, let's say, a short time events, I would say that five years, a very short time events on pollution, can change drastically uh, the community uh, or microbial community. Um, of the coastal ecosystems. Uh, we found also genus variations that follow agricultural contaminations. Uh, and so mostly we found that the shifts that were, we found were irreversible at the time scales that we analyzed. So, and this of course gives you an, a conclusion, a general conclusion about what can paleoecology uh, provide as information for reconstruction, for reconstruction of the uh, coastal, eco uh, coastal ecosystems and how it contributed things to the, to the way um, to the resilience and stabi stability capacity of the species. The resilience of the con ecosystem is uh, uh, when you have uh, an impact and, 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 um, and ecosystems react to this impact by coming back to the previous condition. And stability is, is the way as an ecosystem uh, buffer those impacts uh, not changing a lot. I mean, I think uh, it reminds what um, uh, the previous discussion we had in the, in the, in the previous presentations. Uh, and so sh mostly shows how humans can have an impact on nature's and coastal ecosystems. As for other, the adaptation, species have to adapt to these conditions. And so we, we have studied at least two models of dinoflagellates. Uh, they adapted to phosphorus limitations. Uh, we found how they adapted, uh, showing a different metabolic profiles, uh, by, by and one different specific enzymes, one different specific functional activity. So uh, showing that even though we didn't find any transcriptomics data or ecophysiological, general ecophysiological data that shows the difference, probably one single uh, functional activity can explain, um, functional traits, sorry, can explain how the species uh, can adapt it to environmental um, changes in the, in the coastal areas. Uh, so uh, this also uh, pro provides you an indication of how resurrection ecologies can help in understanding uh, adaptation of the species to the coastal ecosystem changes uh, and uh, how also it can uh, be used. For the next future, so one of the projects that is ongoing, uh, probably Matisse, Matisse, she is my, you, you, you already met Matisse. Uh, we, are, we, we are working now in New Caledonia, uh, still uh, trying to understand how human impact impacted coastal ecosystem areas. Uh, so we have collected sediments in different parts of the area. Oh, you know New Caledonia, it's in, uh, yes, in Australia here in the uh, southern, southern um, uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's a places that, I mean, uh, uh, whose rocks and sediments are very heavy in the metal, uh, metal concentrations. And so um, there are very pristine areas, but despite that, I mean, contamination mostly occurs from this, uh, from this um, uh, metals contamination. So we wonder how this metal contamination uh, changed change, uh, change the, the, the coastal, um, uh, coastal communities of the protists in superficial sediments here, but also we collected the core, uh, like similar to what we had done before, that uh, covers the more or less 300 years. And so what 
it covers both uh, the period of exploitation of the nickel, which is one of the most important resources that is produced there uh, in New Caledonia, is the third country over the world for the uh, exportation of nickel in the world. Uh, so, I mean, there is a lot, a lot of nickel that is produced there, but also a lot of industrialization and mining activity that is there. So, so we wonder how this mining activity has an impact on the, this human activity has an impact on the coastal ecosystems. But also we dated back to the, uh, to the um, 18, 1850, uh, which is the date when the U French colons arrived in New Caledonia. It means that we can probably uh, go back to the before the arrivals of the colonization in uh, French colonization in, uh, in New Caledonia. And the, of course, this brings you to I mean, uh, a lot of cultural and sociological implication of this study because of the fact that I mean, we, we are probably de dealing with how colons impact the coastal ecosystem of the area. So Matisse will tell you more in the future this story. Uh, the next important project that we have is the, uh, <clears throat> the, the Transvesting European Coastline Project track, which is funded by the MBL uh, in Germany and also the Tara Foundation. Uh, it's a project that it's, I think it's the Tara of the future. It means that with, with, with Daniel said before that I mean uh, Tara oceans collected uh, the open oceans. We didn't collect in the, in the frame of the Tarry Ocean, the coastal oceans. And so we, this, I mean, it's the, the idea, is to make the tour of Europe by, by vehicles here that make the tour of uh, uh, Europe, and with the Tarry Ocean boat that will be collecting sediments, uh, over, um, coastal uh, areas uh, uh, along this transect, actually, that we uh, collected in 150 sites over Europe, we will collect in, this will be done in a, in a very multidisciplinary and tran trans-scientific um, approach uh, from, cost, uh, from soils, from different kinds of vegetation, coastal area and sediments, and also uh, water column sediments. And uh, I am the coordinator for the sediment part in all over Europe, uh, both for the superficial sediments and sediment cores. Because the idea is also we that we collect cores, uh, studying the Anthropocene period and studying how humans had an impact on you in Europe over the Anthropocene period. Uh, so these are the, the places where we think we will be collecting cores in Barcelona as well, <laughs> as, we, as uh, we are discussing with Ramiro. Uh, so in, uh, we, we will collect in different cores in different places that have been uh, uh, impact, impacted by bombing also, uh, by also by agriculture, port arbor development, uh, uh, city development also, and also big rivers like Newcastle here. Uh, and this has been also funded by, uh, this will be done in co collaboration with um, different teams uh, in Poland and in Denmark, which are pioneers team for the pyogenetics also in Europe. And I mean, just to be an, an advertised, I mean, for the next future, we'll be looking for postdocs that will be working on for three years on this project. So if you're interested, we can discuss about that. Uh, and the idea is to, yeah, to study the community changes, but also the study of the emergence of new functional, uh, new functional uh, fun function, uh, new genes by meta metagenomic approach. Studying, for example, if new bacteria emerged in, re in correspondence to the to the emergence of new pollutions, for example, and also the harmful algae dispersal across all the areas. So, how, uh, for example, Alexandro Menuti dispersed over over the time over the last two centuries. And for all of these things, we yeah we need postdocs. So, you are interesting. We can discuss. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is the end. Of course, I'm not the only author of this work. I mean, it's this work of mostly eight years. So I mean, it's a lot of col uh, colleagues that col collaborated with me from the genetic, bioinformatics, sedimentology, microfluidics, also historians, communication activity, etc. So I thank all of them. Uh, and to say again that this is a very multidisciplinary approach and we need the integration of different sciences to do paleogenetics and paleoecology. Thank you very much for your attention.